Okay, again, officially welcome to the virtual information session uh, for music composition for the screen, the MFA program at Columbia College Chicago. I am one of your presenters. I'm David Martz. I'm the Assistant Director of Graduate Admissions, and I'll be your point person for all things admissions. Joining me today is Kubilay Uner. Kubi, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Kublai Uner. I talked to a number of you already um, over the course of the past weeks, but it's nice to see everybody. Thanks for coming. And yeah, I'm, I serve as the director of the MFA Music Composition for the Screen program and also one of the faculty in there and a film and television composer. Uh, and between Kubi and I, we're going to sort of take all of your questions, give you all the information you need to know about the Music Composition for the Screen program. But before we really launch, into information about uh, this program specifically. I like to take a step back uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with Chicago, might not be familiar with Columbia as an institution and talk about both. Um, so quickly about Chicago. Chicago is the third largest city in the United States with nearly 3 million residents uh, just within the city limits. Uh, when you extend that out to the greater Chicago land area, which is what we refer to as the suburbs, um, then that number obviously goes up even higher. Uh, we're an affordable cultural hub with a welcoming artist community. Chicago is home to many creative industries and visual arts, dance, film, television, theater, and music. And we, and with that comes a plenty of theaters, galleries, festivals, dance companies, music venues, film and television production houses, and arts organizations. There's no shortage of art to see and artistic opportunities to explore in Chicago. And Columbia really does help you build your professional network and initiate your strategy for creating and nurturing professional relationships, audiences, and supporters. Uh, a little bit about Columbia as an institution. Columbia College Chicago is an arts and media school. As I already mentioned, we're located in Chicago. Our mission is to educate students who will communicate creatively and author the culture of their times. That's our top uh, down mission statement. Um, nearly 50% of the student population identifies as a person of color. Uh, Columbia is a very diverse institution. Uh, they are committed, we are committed to being an anti-racist institution and we very much feel that the more diversity uh, and representation there are, there is in the classroom, that only leads to greater creativity and, uh, um, uh, and innovation. We're located again, as I mentioned, in Chicago in the heart of Chicago's cultural mile, more specifically the South Loop neighborhood, which I'll talk about more in the next slide. And there are about 7,000 uh, students approximately at Columbia. The overwhelming majority of those are undergraduates. Uh, at the graduate level, it's typically anywhere between 200 and 250 students each year. That's across all graduate uh, programs. And then like I said, to, to talk a little about more context about where, context about where we're at, at in the city, uh, Columbia's campus is a condensed urban campus located uh, specifically in the South Loop neighborhood of downtown Chicago. This map uh, shows this. So this is beautiful Lake Michigan Avenue or Lake Michigan over here. This green section of the map is Grant Park, uh, home to many uh, a festival like the Taste of Chicago, Blues Fest, things like that. It's the start and stop of the marathon. Um, the giant music festival, Lollapalooza, all of that takes place in Grant Park each year, which is basically right across the street from you. Uh, this is world famous Buckingham Fountain right here. All of these orange red dots um, uh, indicate the 20 plus administrative residential and academic buildings we have on campus. Um, uh, and then all of them are conveniently located to all of our major public transportation. So the CTA, which is, stands for Chicago Transit Authority, which is our main uh, citywide bus and train line system. And then the Metro trains, which go out to those suburbs. All of these purple dots indicate um, public transportation options. So as you can see, it's really easy to get to uh, via public transportation. Uh, our campus basically is two to three blocks east and west and about an, a mile north and south. So we're a condensed rectangle within the city. And as I already mentioned, we're close to Lake Michigan and other several cultural, historical and entertainment destinations within the city. This is museum campus that has the Shedd Aquarium, Planetarium, Field Museum, and also Soldier Field is right over here. So that's just a quick overview of the city, of the school and where we're at in the city. For the next several slides, I'm gonna turn it over to Kubi. 
Um, hi, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about our program, and of course, most of you have done a lot of research on this already. Um, there is, um, I want to definitely always encourage everybody to really peruse the website. Our website is quite comprehensive. Um, but we're a two-year Master of Fine Arts program, so you have to have a bachelor to attend, um, or an international equivalent. Um, we're part of the music department. We're not part of the, the film and television department, but we work, of course, very closely with them. Um, our program is two years long and 54 credits. And those of you doing your research on other programs doing what we do, we are the longest and the one with the most credits um, when in, within comparable programs in the United States. This is something that is kind of important to me because I do think it gives us the opportunity to give people a real leg up in terms of the depth of instruction and skill building that we're able to do. It is a full-time program with capital F and capital T. Um, <laughs> we do a lot of work. People do do work on the side and, uh, and that basically results in a very intensive two years with a little bit of chance to breathe in the first summer and over winter break. But um, that is also very much intentional in that the intensity of our profession is comparable. Like nobody I know in the world of film, television, video game, music works a 40 hour work week. Um, and uh, yeah, and the cohort is approximately 12 to 13 every, every year. But of course it's a two year program. So right now we have 27 people in the program. Um, the main idea of the program is to create, well, so uh, one step further back, um, people coming into our program come here to learn how to become professional composers for visual media. So film, television, games, AR, VR, you know, and, and, and related areas. Um, we are not an academic program in the sense of that people come here to become college teachers or to become researchers in the field of musicology around film music. We really don't specialize in that. And uh, if that was somebody's goal, we're probably a poor choice because we are all about creating uh, an environment that duplicates exactly as much as it's possible in a college environment, um, which is quite far, um, the, the working conditions in the real world as they're found today and as, they're, as we expect them to be found in the near future. Um, and that results in a very practical hands-on curriculum, high on a lot of music production and related skills around music production and of course scoring, so creating music for dramatic purposes and very low, for instance, there's, you're, you're not gonna write any papers in here. You're not gonna write theses as in 20 pages of words. Um, everything we do is, is aimed at and focused on the pra daily practice of a composer in film, TV, video games, extended reality, et cetera. Um, related to that under, underlying our entire curriculum, and that is something that we are very unique in. Some other programs are now starting to copy us, which I consider flattery. Uh -huh. um, and that is we, everything we do is based on real projects led by the actual composer. So I will not bring in a scene from Dune and say, hey, why don't you score this? And then I'll tell you whether or not you did a good job. Why? Because I'm not the composer of Dune. I wasn't in the room. I've never talked to Denis Villeneuve. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and everything I could tell you would basically be generic. And that is what we are trying to avoid at all costs because the one thing that really um, is at the heart of every film composers or every media composers work is specificity. That what you do is for this project, for these creative, you know, for, for this director, for this TV producer, for this game developer, for this project, for these instructions. And how do we do that with our own musical voice? So it is the opposite of generic. And that's why everything we do is based on real projects. And then all the projects that we bring into the program are led by the original composer. Um, on top of that, of course, we have a lot of um, recording sessions. We have four with professional um, 
um, brought in musicians in professional studios, so not college musicians, not college studios. We do have college studios, we do have college musicians, and those are being used by our composers on top and beyond of what we do in the professional sessions. Um, the, the reason for those professional sessions is twofold. Number one, to build a good portfolio with some live players on top of all the programmed stuff that we do. Of course, we, the bulk of what we do happens in the computer and either with electronic sounds or samples. Um, but to build a portfolio with really outstanding recordings is number one. Number two, though, also to get used to the speed of professional recording sessions, because you will, unless you've ever been in one, you have no idea how fast they are. Um, and, and it really is hard, even for a professional musician, a composer, to keep up. And so that is one of the reasons we have all our sessions not with students who are, for obvious reasons, much slower. Um, we, a big part of our program in many ways is to develop a professional network, starting counterintuitively from your colleagues, from your fellow composers. And uh, some composers, including composers of working composers, say it is important it's not important to network with fellow composers, it's important to network with filmmakers or game developers or TV producers. And while that is true, especially in the beginning, way more than half of your work will actually come from fellow composers because the beginning, uh, your work in the beginning, more often than not after graduation will be um, um, collaborative work, you know, additional music for or assisting somebody or uh, you know the 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 entry level type um, work and that entry level type work is incredibly important in order to build your credibility as a future lead composer where filmmakers feel confident hey I can I can ask this question and they will deliver six weeks from now um, so um, both in terms of ease of getting those jobs and also in terms of building credibility within the community of filmmakers and content developers um, and TV producers, uh, it is important to also network with, um, with fellow composers. So we have a, the most robust alumni network that I, I'm aware of in, in the industry and, uh, and they really do feed each other work all the time. There is of course, because Columbia has a sizable, in fact, for a while it was the biggest, I don't know what the current numbers are, um, film school. And it has a very, very good um, in, interactive arts and media department, which is where game developers go to study their craft and also animators. And so we do do a lot of um, collaborations with them. And so there is a network building already going on outside of the music community as well from pretty much the first semester. Um, I think that's about it. We do have, like I said, we have invested alumni community. We have a very tight knit alumni community and across the last six, seven years, which is when I came, um, everybody pretty much knows everybody and literally worldwide. So we have people like hiring their old friends from Taiwan to help them on a film, et cetera. We're going to go into so those are some broad, some top down sort of broad strokes right. highlights of the program. We're going to talk a little bit about each of them. We'll start with the curriculum. Yeah. So um, again, in order, as you can see, there isn't an academic course in terms of history of film music in this list. These are pretty much all the courses that we have. Um, there are three what I call the sort of the spines of the program, the main pillars, uh, the scoring classes that go and they're. I, they're the main pillars because simply because they go through the two years in Chicago. So that's four semesters. And then we have the fifth semester in LA. And that is the scoring classes, which is where you do the scoring projects um, for the most part. It's a four hour class every week and the cohort is split in two. So it's a four hour class for six or seven people. Um, so it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. And the model is really, if any of you are familiar with the idea of a master class, when some famous violinist comes and works with one-on-one -on -one with another young violinist while five or six or seven others are watching and then the next person takes their turn, but everybody's always watching and listening to the individual instructions the students get from the visiting masterclass teacher, that is the model that we do in scoring. So um, 
it's individualized feedback, but in front of everybody else, because we found that that is where the most learning happens. Like literally you learn as much from the feedback of your colleague scoring the same scene as you do from the feedback you get yourself. We have so two years of that, and those are all based on real projects um, where you're basically walking a mile in the shoes of the original composer, getting set up with the exact same situations, no matter how crazy they were in the original, we'll recreate them here so that you have to, that, so you get, you get a chance to learn how to parry that. Um, another uh, big pillar is our Media Music Tech Lab, also four hours every week for two years. And that is about tech and learning all the tools. It's also the place where you come to get um, clarification on things that are not working for you or that you can't figure out. So it's both, it's a lab class, meaning it has an instructor instruction component as well as a, hey, can we, can we all figure out why this is not working for me? Um, and and uh, a lot of that class actually happens in uh, one of our uh, specialized rooms in the digital uh, music lab where you'd be, everybody's on their own station and it covers softwares that are obvious to everybody like digital audio workstations or samplers, but it also covers softwares that you're maybe not thinking of right now. Like for instance, Unity, which is a programming environment for interactive media or a WISE and FMOD, which are middlewares, so-called middlewares, that basically softwares that integrate, that interface between music and interactive softwares. And uh, we cover all of those. But we also, for instance, in the last semester in Media Music Tech Lab, we cover things like how do you mic various instruments or how do you use an actual hardware compressor. Last on the list for the first year is a two hour class called Screen Music Forum. And that's where literally all the stuff lives that is ancillary, um, but important. So talking about copyright, talking about contracts, uh, having a visiting film editor talk about how they do their work. Um, that's where our guest speakers come. That is the only class where both years are together. And that is actually part of its reason for existence because we have a uh, two-year program, meaning when you're in your second year, a new first year group comes in. And then when they're in their second year, a new first year group comes in. Meanwhile, when you were in your first year, you got to get to know the prior second year. And so you get that zigzag ladder effect that everybody is connected to everybody. And then compare, uh, compare that with the, our Facebook group that is very active, um, secret Facebook group that only Colum, uh, MFA alumni are in. And that is how we have this super tight alumni network. Um, we have specialized courses in the first year. It's the orchestration sequence. And orchestration is not really just classical, but in fact, just as much electronic. Um, so how do you think about um, synths or sound processing in an orchestrational sense? And when I say orchestration, again, I'm not talking about concert, you know, symphony concerts. I'm talking about or the, uh, using colors and instruments and instrument choices, but also mixing choices and placement choices to help tell the story. Um, and that's taught by an amazing orchestrator, Kaz Boyle, who's worked with A.R. Rahman and Craig Armstrong. He's literally just doing another program project with Craig Armstrong now, Trevor Morris. Um, he actually worked with Hans Zimmer as a um, programmer and tech for a while, but then as an orchestrator, um, he's done a lot of A-list films and um, still does them and happy to have them in the program. The other thing in the first year are three five-week survey classes, and they're literally flyovers over film production, games, AR and VR production, and how does music exist in media? Um, and they're just really quick flyover so that you understand basically the basics of the, uh, the principles behind the media that we're actually working for and how the people who make them think. That's the first year. And then the second year, the additional classes are mostly music for games, AR and VR. That's taught by Joel Korlitz, who just uh, finished, uh, who just released Halo Infinite. He was one of the three composers on that. Um, has a BAFTA nominee. Um, and again, he just brings his games. You're working on his games with him so that we don't make anything up. And then the other thing is uh, a very kind of unusual thing for a media music program, but I find it to be one of our more important classes and that's conducting for media. 
it is uh, six credits. So the whole second year, three credit three hour class, and it's conducting and sightseeing solfege. Um, and the reason why it's important is, as you can tell by all the stuff that you look at beforehand, um, everything we do is very mediated. There is a machine between us. There's a film between us and our music. There are computers. There are all these kind of um, intermediate concerns. Conducting for media, besides teaching you how to conduct, because in our live sessions, of course, you have to conduct real musicians. What it also does, it, it gives you a whole new relationship to the music that you've that you're writing using nothing but your own self, your arms and your voice. And everybody, um, it's, it's one of those classes that are quite intense, um, especially also because some people come in with you know, very little sort of classical training. Doesn't matter, um, you catch up. Um, and, uh, and at the end of it, everybody says they have a completely different relationship to not just their written scores, they can actually read their own scores, but also, to making music in their head, imagining music, writing music in their head, not relying only on the fingers to kind of like figure something out and then capturing it um, that way. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of an essential skills class, sort of a back to the basics on top of the obvious skills of conducting. And then these last three bullet points are our LA semester. Uh, career development is basically visiting uh, guest speakers and then uh, the internships, um, which we refer, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then the thesis, which in our case, again, it's not a written thesis. It's a big piece of music for full orchestra and electronic pre-records. Which later is now. Let's talk about semester in LA. Yes, <laughs> and there we are. In fact, that's the Fox Newman stage. We're, uh, we were there now for three years in a row, and it's my favorite stage in all of the world. Um, of course, every time you go see a Fox movie, that famous fanfare that's recorded there that was re-recorded when they, in the late 90s, they rebuilt the room a little bit. But if you look online, it's actually a fantastic room because it sounds so good while they rebuilt the whole control room, etc. They did not touch the walls because it sounded so good. So if you look at photos, it looks like a storage place. It looks like where you keep theater sets or something, but it sounds fantastic. So um, we, we're there for five weeks. Um, it's part of the curriculum. Everybody goes. Um, we have in the career development class, we have our daily guest speakers. That's a lot of composers, uh, you know, people like Thomas Newman come to visit. We actually visited Harry Gregson Williams in the studio a number of times. Uh, and then, of course, we ended up Zooming during the pandemic. Um, uh, same thing, James Newton Howard, um, Laura Cartman came in, Miriam Cutler. So a number of composers come and talk about what they feel is important, how they got there. Um, but other guest speakers include um, composer lawyers, people who deal with contracts, agents, um, music editors. Um, so anybody in the industry that interfaces with composers, we have come in and it's basically 20 uh, guest speaker sessions every day in the morning. And then in the afternoon, everybody goes to their internships and the internships are usually with composers but they don't have to be. Some people interned at recording studios or with composer PR firms, uh, depending on personal interest. And the way that works is after about three semesters, at the end of the third semester, we start thinking about this. At the beginning of the fourth semester, I sit down with everybody one-on-one -on -one and we create a game plan on who they want to intern with, uh, with the only condition being that that person should be in LA because of course that's where we are going to be and the internships are 90% of the time in person even during the pandemic we ended up having a lot of in-person internships um, and uh, and then we basically create a hit list um, and I go down that list and call people until we find somebody who's willing to take on that person but um, it's not gonna it's not a random game you don't get assigned or anything it is somebody that you request and that we talk about um, also based on obviously based on your personal musical style and your tastes and especially also on your plans for the future especially also on your plans for the immediate future and then last in the last week is our big thesis session. And that is uh, the fourth and biggest session it at Fox um, or a similar studio 
uh, with a full professional orchestra. Uh, over the last two years, we've started to split the orchestra and do what they call striping, which is a very common technique used more often than not right now, actually, in film scoring. And what that means is we recorded the strings and the harp in the morning, and then we recorded the winds and uh, the woodwinds and the brass in the afternoon. And what that allowed us to do is we it allowed us to have a much bigger orchestra. So instead of initially we had like 56 people, but now that we split it, the pieces are not are, are basically now about three minutes long, but we had like 75 piece orchestras. So um, I mean, so that was just fun. Um, and it's obviously a rare opportunity. Um, the, uh, the orchestra is the same orchestra that will play on a Ludwig Göransson um, session or, or, or any other John Debney session. It's contracted by Peter Rodder, who is contracting for, in fact, I just saw his credits on Black Widow because I watched that finally last night. Um, and then um, we have a conductor because sometimes people choose to be in the booth that's a long conversation, but there's obviously the right place for the composer can either be in the booth as a producer or on the, on the stage as the conductor. Uh, we do both uh, depending on each composer gets to choose. And we talk about that, of course. And then not last, but absolutely not least, we have a phenomenal engineer. And so it's Dennis Sands who look up his credits. It's uh, like Avengers Endgame. He has like 300 film credits and they're all Avengers Endgame size. Um, and he's a wonderful, wonderful person, an incredible engineer. And so this is kind of the Rolls Royce experience where after all the various experiences that are maybe more um, uh, uh, germane to the beginnings of a composer or to the indie side of our work, it is also important to get this experience of what, how do you work when you have like the high end team? And a lot of our composers, in fact, right there in the, the guy with the baseball cap, he's been working with um, Matt Margeson. And, uh, and uh, so that's the, uh, the, the, the Kingsman composer and, uh, and so he's he's kind of working in that world right now as an assistant. Oh, and also way back in the corner there, that's Brandon right there, yeah. And he just became Hator Pereira's assistant, who you know from the Minions and uh, Despicable Me uh, scores and and Angry Birds. And uh, and again, so he's he actually was just at uh, Fox um, on a job. Um, so, oops, we're kind of trying to run the gamut of all the different ways that we work. And this is of course film, the same thing for games. Um, this is a big important part. As I was saying, every project that we teach is uh, based on real projects. So if it was just me and Joel and Kaz teaching, we'd have too limited a set of projects to build a program on. And that is why we have the composers in residence. Um, they come in for seven weeks at a time. And here's a list of some of the ones that were here up until last year. Um, and they bring one of their projects. They, they work with our composers for seven weeks and do the exact same thing that I do with my films, which is have them walk through the process on that project as they experienced it and always on the whole project. So not just the one scene, but the whole project from how do I plan this whole score? How do, and, and then how do I make this cue fit not just this moment in the film, but fit the whole of the entire story and of the entire film and of the entire musical experience. And of course, fit the instructions of the director. Um, so you can see here the list uh, of people that we've had and some of the projects. Um, and you can see that the projects run the gamut from like dynamic music partners. All these are like animated um, action series that they do. Chance Thomas, um, all the Lord of the Rings and similar um, properties, but on the video game side and uh, Lord of the Rings Online is of course the online version of that game. Um, Joel Goodman, those are all documentaries. Uh, Roni Kirschman, those are all like sort of dark drama series. Well, some of the other, but she brought the sinner, which is now in its fourth season, and that's a that's a kind of really grown up like a, a, a drama series. Brandon Campbell, um, he actually just did a bunch of music with Ramin Jawadi on uh, Dune, 
uh, not Dune, um, Eternals. Um, but he brought the letter for the king, which was that Netflix mini series, that sort of like young, uh, young adult adventure series, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, we're trying to really, really create a broad experience and a broad set of experiences for our composers to prepare them for pretty much anything that could hit them afterwards. And so the one thing I always make sure is the three composers in residence that everybody gets to experience during the two years um and work with that they're as different from one another as possible and then some recent alumni you started to talk about brandon earlier but oh yeah so there's brandon he literally just said uh, this is like one week old information he's a full-time assistant to Hector Pereira uh Dylan's been working with Tom Howe <laughs> interestingly enough he started working with Tom during his internship with Bear McCrary so and he went came up to me and said Kubi what do I do I can't turn this down but I already committed to interning with Bear and I smiled and said you got to do both you're just not going <laughs> to sleep much because he's right. You can't turn down Tom Howe and you cannot back out of a commitment already made. And he made it happen. And he's still working night and day. Um, somebody who's actually not on here is Catherine Nguyen, um, also from 20. She just got hired as a full time assistant in the composition music department at uh, Blizzard Games. Um, and then Alex uh, Riak, also not here yet, because literally all this just happened. We, I get like three, four um, notifications pretty much every month from people. Alex Riak just started working with uh, um, Walter Murphy, who does Family Guy and uh, what's the other show? Um, I'm blanking now. Um, but, you know, those kind of like Fox uh, Sunday night cartoon shows um and always full orchestra he was actually also just at fox for walter murphy um uh, yeah and you'll see the rest here alexis um was an assistant to uh, on a pixar feature she actually also just had her a short that she scored here at columbia enter a festival here in chicago that's outside of columbia um Tom Videla has been working night and day um, since he graduated. I actually hired Tom and Adam, uh, who is not on here, um, for a couple of projects of my own. Um, Epson went back to China, um, built his studio in Beijing, and is one of the busiest alumni that we have. Um, and has a, a, a lot of his own projects. Kamani has been working um, with um, Chris Bowers, um, I would just have to like grab my brain for the name <laughs> of the Bridgerton composer. Um, and Chris Bowers, actually, they, they're having a premiere with the LA Phil now, like an actual concert music premiere. Um, but Kamani has been working with Chris now for a long time. Before that, he was actually working with, uh, he was interning with Ludwig Göransson. And, and on, I, I don't have to read you the list, you can see it here. And uh, a lot of these are also on the website. Um, listed and there is a ton more um, The one thing like I said the goal of this program is to let people give people a chance to actually start working in the industry in ways that people start working in the industry now that are viable and uh, I'm happy to report it's really working we have uh, a lot of people work within sometimes weeks um, at the latest within months of being um, out of the program so I could let Kubi talk about his alumni all day long if I if he wanted yes, to. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> exactly we, <need> to, <laughs> we got it. We got to stick to. Oh, we're already at ten thirty six. Yeah. So all right. So I have a couple more slides to get through, and then we'll start taking questions. So I just wanted to quickly mention some other addition. Additionally, to the resources you have within the music department, um, there are other campus resources that you can take advantage of while you're a student here. This building is our newest building to the Columbia Building family. This is our student center. This is the communal collaborative meeting space for all students, regardless of their program or major or department. So within the student center are plenty, uh, what is a maker space, it's a DIY crafting space. There's a fitness center, career center, health center um, is, uh, is on campus. You have access to counseling centers, academic uh, center for tutoring and counseling, services for students with disabilities, Shop Columbia, that's um, one of our, um, uh, student stores, so students who sell their work, uh, um, you can do that through Shop Columbia, a fabrication studio, a library, 
Um, I didn't put on this list and I now realize I probably should. We have an international student and scholar services office who works closely with our international students. And as uh, if you probably couldn't tell already, um, there's usually a large uh, contingent of international students that are within this program each year. And then lastly, I list my office, the School of Graduate Studies office, because we too are a resource for you throughout your time at Columbia. We don't just work with you at admissions and then say goodbye to you once you start the program. We continue to work with you throughout your two years here um, and, and as a resource or as you need us uh, um, on campus. And I want to um, add- Go ahead, yeah. I want to add that both um, the School of Graduate Studies and David as our main contact there and Claire Lake, who heads the International Students and Scholar Services Office are phenomenal. And uh, like the, the level of support that you guys are giving is really, really, really exemplary. So it's a real, well, real uh, service for um, all of us in the program. Well, thank you very much for those kind words. And Claire is great too. Claire and uh, I will also probably have a, we've had already done one international um, student uh, Q&A info session. We'll likely do a, a couple others coming up. So stay tuned for that. More from me, more from Claire in the near future. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about funding. So funding is obviously an important part of the decision making process when you're thinking about going to graduate school. Um, funding at the at, at Columbia usually falls into four categories. It, it's scholarships, it's working on campus, it's working off campus, and it's federal loans. So scholarships, um, Columbia does have a variety of student scholarships, both for incoming and continue, continuing students. The full listing of scholarships can be found at columbia.edu slash scholarships, and I encourage you to, to look through those. Um, uh, but I want to talk about the incoming student scholarship, which is called our Graduate Merit Award Scholarship. Those are merit-based scholarships. Um, that you apply, that you do not need to do um, a, anything separate to apply to that. You just apply to the program on or before the deadline of January 14th, and then you will automatically be considered for those scholarships. Those scholarships uh, are selective and competitive, uh, but they range anywhere from 25% of your tuition being covered, maybe upwards of 75% of your tuition being covered. Uh, and again, they're merit-based and your application for the program also serves as your application for scholarship consideration. Uh, when it comes to working on campus, all graduate students, whether they're international or domestic, can work a maximum of 20 hours a week on campus. Uh, assistantships are jobs that are assigned at the time of admissions, and they are jobs where you work with the music department specifically, um, and you are paid with a stipend. Assistantships are similar to the incoming student scholarships and that you those are selective and competitive as well and they're merit based as well. Uh, and you can't apply to those you have to sort of be awarded those at the time of admission. So again, if you apply on or before the deadline, you will automatically be considered for an assistantship as well as any incoming student scholarships. All other campus jobs, uh, whether it's through the music department or not, um, will require a separate application and you'll apply after you've been uh, become an enrolled student. Working off campus, uh, this is only for domestic students. Uh, so only US citizens or permanent residents can, can legally work off campus. Um, international students, if you're here on an F1 visa, you are only able to work on campus. Um, but our student, student employment portal that lists all of our campus jobs will also list some off campus jobs. Uh, and then the academic departments and career center will also likely know of internships or other opportunities that uh, uh, that are related to your field as well. And then lastly, I mentioned domestic federal loans. Again, just for US citizens or permanent residents, you uh, will wanna fill out your FAFSA um, right around now actually. Um, uh, and then if you are admitted, you'll receive an award letter that will inform you of your loan eligibility. So we can talk more about these if you have questions during Q&A, but I wanted to briefly talk about funding. So application requires requirements. Let's talk about what it takes to apply to the program. So all music comp MFA applications will require an application fee, a resume, two letters of recommendations, transcripts uh, from all your colleges and universities that you've attended, if you went to an international school or a school outside of the United States, we'll need a transcript evaluation for those, uh, a self-assessment essay, and then a portfolio. Rather than read what's on there, it's all listed on the website. Kubi, what do you want to talk say about the portfolio? I'm assuming some of you all have questions during Q&A, but uh, before we get to those, what do you sort of take away do you have about the portfolio and the essay? Um, yeah, so the, the first of all, um, uh, the essay is more important than you probably think. 
um, because we really, really want to know who you are as a uh, person and as a composer. Um, and there are some sort of uh, questions um, on the website to kind of kickstart your thought process, but you do not have to like answer them. It's not about those questions. It really is just about going deep on a why, why, you know, why you want, why, why are you interested in this program, both in this program in particular, but also in this field? And, you know, how do you see yourself as a collaborator? Um, what, what about this is important to you? Um, and anything else that you feel is important to uh, for us to know about you as a person and as an artist. So the, the essay, um, stick within the word count. Um, the one thing I can tell you, um, just sort of insider tip, in this field, in our field of media music composition, fulfilling delivery requirements is absolutely essential. So for instance, if the essay is supposed to be, I forget actually the word count, it's on the website. It's yeah, we can look that up during Q&A. Yeah, um, but whatever the word count is, stick within it. Um, if it says exactly four, a minute, four pieces for the portfolio now more than 12 minutes, stick with that. Um, because that is actually an important part of our field. Um, for the portfolio, um, it doesn't have to be music to picture. Um, it can be. If, um, and it's, this is also um, described on the website, but if you have something that's music underneath a dialogue heavy scene, you obviously want that music in the film excerpt to be mixed the way it should be mixed, which is underneath the dialogue. People need to hear the dialogue. But in case in, ca in a case like that, you can submit the same piece twice, once with the dialogue and once without, either as audio only or as video with no dialogue, um, so that we can actually hear your composition yeah. a little bit more clearly. And then that will just count as one piece of however long it is length. Um, in general, when you try and figure out which four pieces you want to send us, my best advice is send your best work send only the things that you are absolutely passionate about, but within that, send the broadest possible range. So do not send the broadest possible range, period. Don't go like, I hate action cues, I hate action movies, but I gotta have a Hans style action cue in there. You do not. You want to really showcase who you are, your best self, but within that, if you're a songwriter who also does some 12 tone string quartets, make sure that you have a song in there and some 12 tone string quartet music. Um, but basically it's the portfolio should be a set of pieces where you go, um, this is, you know, where you, where you would show it to somebody with the biggest smile on your face because you're so goddamn proud. That's I get asked all the time. People obviously don't usually have just pieces sitting around that come in at exactly three minutes a piece. So how do you go about like fade in or fade out from that? Yeah. Fade in or fade out. Totally cool. Happens in film all the time. Um, so you can just take, you know, if the, if the real, if the real interesting portion is the middle three minutes, um, quick fade in middle three minutes, quick fade out. Now also a couple of those pieces should have, um, a score attached to them, like written score. We want to see that you can do that. Um, they, uh, and if, if you end up, sh you know, sending the middle three pieces, make sure that it's at least notated that the, the section that we're listening to starts on page 12 in the score or something. Um, they don't have to have live players. In fact, one of the pieces should very much be produced in the computer. Um, and if you can showcase that you're really good with faking acoustic instruments, uh, which is very important in our field. Even all, all the film scores that end up being live recorded, they all start out as mock-ups. And so um, if you have good mock-up skills, show them off in your portfolio. Okay. Um, and if you don't, then don't. Like you don't have to pretend anything. You don't have to feel like, oh no, I'm missing this piece. Everybody is missing a piece. Just show us your best self and within that best self, the broadest range. All right, let's get through these last couple of slides so we can get to questions because we're now got 45 minutes left of questions. So I'll just quickly mention if there are all admissions, all application requirements can be found at column.edu slash grad admissions. 
And if you're an international applicant, there may be additional um, steps to the application process, which we can also talk about. Just a quick overview of the timeline. So between now and the, and the deadline, you should be attending virtual information sessions like today uh, and doing research on your program. You should collect all your application materials. So start thinking about your pieces that you're going to submit for your portfolio. Start writing and rewriting and triple writing your essay. Start requesting your transcripts or getting the evaluation process started and figuring out who your letter writers are going to be and ask their permission and getting that process started as well. And then the deadline is January 14th. That's where you want to submit your application on or by. Uh, and then no later than eight weeks after the priority deadline, that's the latest decisions will be released. Sometime between, so that's that's the beginning of March through the middle of March. Sometime between January 14th and the middle, and the beginning of March slash middle of March, an interview will be conducted. And an interview for this program really is sort of the first um, sort of cut, if you will. It's the first uh, a process and just sort of move, being moved on to the next stage of admission. So uh, Kubi and their faculty review committee will make a decision of who they're going to invite for an interview. Uh, it'll happen sometime between, like I said, March 1st and or sometime between January 14th and March 15th, somewhere between there. Um, as soon as we determine who is going to invite it to interviews, we will contact you and let you know. Uh, and if you didn't get invited to an interview, then then you'll sort of be uh, denied at that point. That is sort of the first round of admissions. And then the interviews will happen. And then shortly after that, we'll release decisions. Um, and then April 15th, that is the date that you'll want to tell us your decision by. So if you are admitted, we'll want to know if you're accepting the offer and coming to Columbia by April 15th. OK, we can talk more about that in Q&A, but that was a quick overview of the timeline. Just lastly, uh, you can begin or continue your application by going to apply.colum.edu slash apply. I'm going to try to put all these links in chat too. And then take full advantage of any upcoming admissions events. For instance, um, next week, uh, our um, current student ambassador in the program, David uh, Neville, he couldn't be here today because he has a class conflict, but he will be available next week if you wanted to talk to a current student and ask uh, a current student uh, questions about the program and uh, and their their perception and his take on on the program. So that's something else that you have available to you next week for those of you who want to continue to do your research about the program. And that's it. That's the end of the presentation. Let's go to questions. I'm going to stop the recording first, and then we can get started.